I'd like to ask you to close your eyes and we'll pray and ask God to bless us. Dear Lord in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning you have given to us. Lord, we are able to sit here and listen to your word. Father, I pray that the message that you have impressed me to share, as I say, Lord, may it not be dropped or fall through the cracks and disappear. Lord, as the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, my words shall go forth and shall not come back void. It shall accomplish everything I send it to do. And today we know that, we, that when your word comes out of your mouth and reaches our soul, it will accomplish what that word is intended to do. Please, Lord, bless us in a very special way and bless the rest of the church member families, Lord, wherever they are right now and lead them to have a deeper, intimate experience with you, just as you do today with us. It's our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, it's a very challenging uh, experience to live as a Christian in this contemporary age. Um, there are many reasons why. And one very important reason is that the world we're living in is a world that has intentionally rejected Jesus, okay? So that's make, that makes it even more difficult. Uh, not some people, uh, they just simply don't know the truth. They just simply don't know Jesus. Like many years ago, uh, back in the Pacific Island countries, in some of these places, they just simply didn't know Jesus. They had a concept of God, an idea that God may or should exist. And they tried to translate that concept in different forms of their association with the nature that they were living in, stones and rocks, river systems and things like that. But they didn't know. But when they knew, they suddenly turned around and came back. But the society we're living in now is a society, in fact, the Western civilization is rooted in Christianity. Christianity played a major role in saving the Western civilization. Major role. Not just symbol, it's small, big way, influence. And so you can see that, that the civilization that we are part of now is a civilization that came out of Christianity or at, at a big influence uh, by the Christian religion, and that religion is being rejected. It's been rejected. So that's what makes us as Christians some of the challenging Christians to live during your day and age. So today I thought um, maybe this is just sort of part one of a series I want to share. And I, just a bit of this introductory thought that I want to leave with you is that, is that God didn't know that this was going to be like this, yet yes, he knew it. What is he doing right now? There are things he's doing right now. So I want us to explore that. And if you have your Bibles with you, uh, we'll commence our text today by reading the popular text we read in Matthew chapter 28. Okay, let's hop into Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18, 19, the commission, you know, the uh, commission here. Uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16 downward, it says. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, worshipped them. Some doubted. So some people are doubting when they saw Jesus. And then when they worshipped him, they're giving him the due respect associated with the teacher and the resurrected Messiah. In response to that act of worship, this is Jesus talking now. In response to that act of worship, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, whole power in given is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even 
with you even unto the end of the world, it says. This text is a popular text we all know. But look at this text again. Look at the context of this text. The context is simply says this. I'll read it. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into where? Into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So Jesus told them, I want you to go to Galilee. The Bible doesn't specify which mountain it was in Galilee. In Jerusalem, it's the Mount of Ascension. We always think about that. But Galilee, the Bible doesn't seem to be indicating in this particular passage which mountain it was. But it was one, most, one of those mountains around the uh, Sea of Galilee area. And this is where he, he, uh, uh, he had made an appointment with them. So they go there, and the part I like is this. When they saw him, they worshipped him and some doubted. So this is the setting here. The setting here is a setting of intimate connection. There's a meeting place, a time appointed, and in that meeting place, it is appointed time when Jesus and the disciples met. The disciples role in this association is they were going with the spirit of worship, okay? Worship here indicates respect and loyalty that they gave. So that, that's what it's saying here. So in the context of that intimate connection and worship, he gives them the gospel commission. So the point I want to make before I go to the next part of the discussion is this. Did you realize that the gospel commission was given in the context of worship? It was given in the context of worship. So that means that we cannot effectively do outreach work if our worship is not correct and not right. You can't do outreach work if our worship life is not right. We have to worship Jesus. We have to worship Jesus in an, in a, in an intimate way, in a personal way. If we live intimate lifestyle, a life that is totally connected with God, the power of association we have with Jesus will translate in our effort to witness to others. So that's why it's important to take note in this particular verse that, that, that Jesus promises them power in the context of worship. These disciples were worshiping God, and while they're worshiping, he tells them in response to the worship, the power, all power in heaven on and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is interesting here is that Jesus never told them about the power that will oppose them. The power that will oppose them, he never told about, talked to them about. He didn't say, the devil will be like this. The governments will be like this. But he simply said, I have got a power. Just go, he said. So, if we look at the New Testament, come down to the book of Acts, how they organize themselves in chapter 2. Okay, let's come to chapter 2 here. We look at how they organize themselves when they received that power. Okay, this is what they say. It says here, in chapter 1, uh, they're replacing people, you know. Um, where is this? In chapter 1, it says, appointment of Matthias to succeed Judas. It says, wherefore, verse 21 of chapter 1, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken half from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us for his resurrection. So what are they saying? We have to appoint one to witness. So this complex exercise of trying to change humanity, this complex exercise of, of destroying paganism in front of them, they only needed to witness. That's all. They only need a simple thing, simple suggestion, simple concept, and yet that simple concept was to destroy what appeared like a big, massive mountain in front of us. It's almost like David before Goliath. 
David had no military skills. He had no idea of how, how uh, uh, an army should, should go and meet the enemy in the battlefield. I do not know how, but in certain cultures, military patterns are well documented. You need to know how to handle things. And yet, David never did that. He just went in the name of God. And when he went in the name of God, he was able to co conquer Goliath. Just like that, the Christian church here, they had this massive Goliath in front of them. And yet, all they needed to do is this simple thing. They needed to witness the story of resurrection. That's all. They needed to witness the story of resurrection in the verbal expression as well as in their zeal and the desire to die for it. They did it. And they appointed two individuals were selected. Uh, Joseph called Barsabbas, was sent him Justice and Matthias. And they prayed, and the Lord, which knoweth the hearts of men, shew whether these two thou hast chosen, that I may, that ye may take part in this ministry and apostleships, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the Lord fell upon Matthias. Okay, so Matthias is selected. So the point I'm making is that they didn't see the challenge in front of them. They, all they needed to do is look at them and what they needed to do. So what kind of lessons can we learn from this one? As Christians, when we live in this world, we are bombarded by so many things. I think majority of the time, we are always looking at the enemy. We are always thinking of all things like, um, you look at a problem, and you think of the problem, and you become too involved in thinking about a problem that you become completely defeated. We become completely defeated. We spend so much time worrying about a problem. I think there is a reason why when he spoke to Joshua in the Old Testament, Joshua, be of good courage. He said, do not be afraid. That means God is telling us and the Christians, never make decisions based on what you see in front of you. The challenging powerful, threatening power that may be in front of you. Never make decisions based on what you see. Try and look at what God has placed in front of you and do it faithfully. Do it faithfully. That's what we need to see. These people, they only saw a simple solution to a problem they thought they need to solve. They need to appoint someone to replace Judas. And when they did that, that's all they could do. They appoint a missing member, replace it with someone, and the next thing they did, they spent the time praying and studying the scriptures, confessing the faults one to another. And as they're doing, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, it says here that the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one accord. When the day of Pentecost came, what happened? They were one accord, completely united. Why were they completely united? Because they were simple agendas that they agreed and they agreed on the simple agendas. Agendas like, for instance, one agenda, that's it. We need to witness. We need to witness. That was one simple thing. So they said, they agreed that that is the simple agenda and they agreed on the concept. And when they were united in that agenda, the power of the Holy Spirit came. Sometimes we try to interpret unity, meaning all of us must feel the same. Or all of us must eat like same time. You know, those kind of ideas of unity is not, this text is not talking about that. Unity is the unity agree. We agree on a duty that we want to do good together. We unite on a set of belief that we want to agree together. And then when we agree on the set of beliefs, agree on the duties, then God gives us the Holy Spirit. We are making something that is so simple, very complicated. And 
I want to read what Ellen White wrote here about this thing here, okay? It's interesting. In, if you look at the uh, uh, book, uh, Acts of the Apostles, there's a section called the church triumphant. And these are, these are some of the things that he writes. I see he wrote, and I want to read just a quotation of this particular passage based on the book of Acts. It says, at the beginning of the ministry, some of them were hand men, Ellen White writing, but their consecration to the course of the master was unreserved. And under his instruction, they gained a preparation for the great work committed to them. Grace and truth reigned in their hearts, inspiring their motives and controlling their accents. Their lives were laid, sorry, their lives were eat in Christ Jesus and self was lost sight or submerged in the deep depths of infinite life, love. Next part it says, the disciples were men who knew how to speak and pray sincerely. Men who could hold of the might of the strength of Israel. How closely they stood by God, side, uh, by the side of God, and bound their personal honor to his throne. As I was reading through, there was one thing that came into my mind that I want to share with you is this, okay? These disciples, when they were doing their work, um, um, they realized that, that, that um, their commitment to do God's work was of very important uh, in terms of value. They thought that they lived in this world only to achieve that. That was the sole reason, reason, all reason why they were living. And that meant that their own and daily need to survive, like food and drinks and, you know, individual needs like that, were blessings that God gave because they got stuck with God's agenda and God's priority. Our problem in our day is that I think we got stuck trying to look after yourself, but maybe God's agendas and priorities may potentially become a second choice in our lives. You know, it could potentially be something like that. And we may still become, um, I don't know, I was very careful how I'm using, but we are defeated, let's say. We are defeated. The paganism that the first century Christian church had to deal with, it's, it's paganism that was complex. It was very difficult. Um, many people believed during those days that it is normal to believe uh, many gods. Polytheism was so popular in those days. It was very difficult for monotheistic religions to thrive and succeed because in the thinking of the people, one God is incapable of solving the multifaceted lifestyles that they were living. So soldiers need a God of the soldiers. A farmers need a God of the farmers. The gods responsible for the rivers needs those people who need waters and things like that. So you can imagine it was really logical to have many gods because of the multiple tasks and things that they had to do. And when you started talking about one God being the source of all these things, you couldn't sell that across. And yet, despite all those challenges, what a Christian church did is, they didn't go out looking for arguments how dare, yet they just simply witnessed the power of resurrection. The power of God with the symbol trust in God did marvelous things. So it, it may sound as if I'm trying to make you people become, I mean, the church to become witnesses. That's okay. I mean, that's important. But in, in life, we are living life. You know, we have to look for money and food and things like that. We struggle through families, struggle through to paying bills and things like that. But do you realize that the Christian church in the early century 
also had those challenges. Also had to deal with concepts of bills, concepts of raising a family, concepts of, of farming, or all these kinds of things. They also had it. But why is it that you don't hear those kinds of stories coming out in the New Testament writings? Why? It's not because those things were not important. The reason why they are not mentioned is because those things were taken in as part of the witnessing thing. So their lifestyle was like that. So our greatest challenge, my brothers and sisters today, is to try to model that lifestyle. The lifestyle to say that God is, is number one in everything I do or we do in life. And um, the whole Roman Empire, you imagine, the Roman Empire was built not overnight. Hundreds of years went in the building of the Roman Empire. It was an accumulation of ideas from generations past that came on and eventually became this massive organization. But Christianity dismantled it. Christianity dismantled it. The first 300 years of Christianity's existence, the first 300 years, the Roman Empire bordering as far as India up to Northern Ireland, to Northern Africa, that massive continent, 75%, 75% of the whole continent, that the empire had become Christian. That's in 300 years. During the lifetime of Paul alone and Peter alone, the gospel went as far as England. Did you know that? Went to Scotland during the lifetime of the apostles. Went to India. So you'll, write, you'll read in, in the writings of Paul when Paul writes about this gospel that is preached in all the world, he says. What was that world? It was the Roman world. So in other words, the gospel was preached to the world that was known then. And no wonder why the disciples were saying Jesus is coming very soon. Because the gospel is reaching to the edges of the universe that they knew. Didn't have to wait for another 2,000 years. But God saw me. So some of us, during that time, our forefathers, I don't know where they were. Somewhere in Africa, I guess. But God saw those people that Peter and James and John didn't see. If humanity, the people living in the surface of the earth, were the Roman, that world, the Roman rule, Jesus would have come after 300 years. He would have come 300 years. Because 75% had become Christians already, there's no need. But Jesus thought about us. The point I'm making is this. A massive complex organization was dismantled, not because Christian, Christians were actively involved in politics, were actively involved in any other things in this world. They were just simply trusting God and being faithful to the commission that Jesus gave. The point I'm making, one talk is this. This gospel commission is not just one aspect of Christianity. It is the thing that dismantled Roman Empire. Today, we have a complex system again, the Western civilization that I was talking about. Why should we waste our time thinking about, this is me, I'm just thinking, thinking about heart and techniques when we can just simply be what they did, you know, just trust in God, witness. How can you witness? Talk about it and live that life. That's it, simple. We talk about it and live that life. When you live it, no scientist will arrest you for that. I mean, uh, say that you are wrong. No authorities will send you to jail. You know, the disciples, when they lived in the first century, They just simply love, be joyful, forgiving one another, 
talking a lot on grace and forgiveness. And eventually they took over. The Christian church today, we become too technically minded that we want to interpret the Bible, but we don't have, want the power of the Bible in our lives. We are so conscious of interpreting, but to leave it out, we become hopeless at it. And do you think the devil is threatened because of that? No. The devil will be threatened if we actually leave this word out. If we leave it, that's a powerful testimony. We say what we do. We talk about what we are. If we talk about what we are and we tell others what we passionately believe and we are willing to die for it, that in itself will destroy paganism that we know of today. In closing, I'm telling you this story. We'll build it up the second time when I'm coming here. When we were meeting down there, some of you are there. Remember that place? Lord's Avenue. There was a white Australian man that came over there. He's not a church goer. He's not a Christian. This man came in because I think it was Alex Curry. Pastor Alex Curry must have met him somewhere. And Alex Curry thought and said, look, I have to bring this man to a Seventh-day Adventist church. And he thought of one took church. I can clearly remember it was not Alex Curry preaching. It was my turn to preach. I was preaching up in front and I saw Alex Curry coming with this man. And he came, they sat in front. And then after the service, they left. They didn't stay back for lunch. During the week, Alex Curry rang me. So I went to his office for something else. That's something else we were talking about. And I, he, at that time, he was the acting chaplain at Sydney Adventist Hospital. I went to his office, and this is Alex Curry. This is what he told me. He said, you remember the man that I brought on Sabbath? Yes, I said. When I took him out of the Wantok Church, when we came, he didn't talk. He said. He was sitting in the back of the car. He was, he was like sitting there. And Alex broke the silence. And he was picking after conversation or some things that they were talking about. And as they were talking, this man got up and said this. He said, if Christianity was like that little church that we born gone to, the world would be a better place, he said. I do not know what we did that day, that Sabbath, that really challenged this man that he went away impressed like that. You know, the point I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, is this. The God who abundantly blesses people is with us. I do not know how you interpret blessing. You blessing just a nice Christmas wish. You know, God bless you. What do you mean when you say that? This powerful God of blessing is with us. I like to think blessing as food, water, friends, time to crack joke with others. Having clothes on, have a bit of money in the bank, have a car that you drive around, a family that is healthy. I, am I right in saying that those are blessings? Some kind of security for the future? 
Am I right in saying that those are blessings? Can you imagine those blessings that I'm mentioning now, Bible says that those blessings, Ellen White in Steps to Christ says, all those things come through one channel and that channel is Jesus. That channel is Jesus. In giving Jesus to us, he has given us the, all of those blessings. Jesus is for forgiveness of sin, yes. But not only that. Jesus is the channel through which we are blessed with all these blessings that I've just mentioned. When Jacob left his parents and he was going to his mother's village, remember that story? He had his dream and he saw the letter, the mystic letter to connect at heaven and earth. He saw angels going up and angels coming down. Those angels are symbols of blessings. What were those blessings? Blessing of security and good health and food and all these things that everyone else looked for. God is telling Jacob, I'm giving you through this channel, this letter. That letter Jesus said in the book of John is Jesus. So young kids, young children and mothers and fathers and all of us sitting here, if you deny Jesus, if you think Jesus is a second priority to you, you are removing the channel blessing aside for the things you want in life, but a channel through which these things come, you're putting aside. And it's a terrible, foolish decision anyone can make. As Christians, we have to channel Jesus with us. No one else have to channel. You know what I mean? I think we were having this dedicatory prayer at Nako's place, and I think one, one was asking that question. Someone, I think, I think it's uh, Viney asked that question. She said, how come that some Christians, they don't go to church, and yet they have lots and lots of things in life? You know what I mean? They have lots and lots of things. Well, these groups of people who have lots and lots of things, some of, of course, becoming filthy through crook, filthy rich through crook ideas. Others are simply outworking people. Simply outworking people. Jesus doesn't make us lazy. Did you know that? Jesus doesn't make us lazy. Jesus, in fact, gives us the ideas to work hard. Work hard. Pagan religion says that you don't have to work hard. Free money, free food. Cargo, cargo in PNG, we call cargo cult mentality. You just wish that some of buckets of blessing will come from heaven. That's cargo cult. That's, that's not Jesus' way. The idea of Jesus is hardworking. You know, when, when disciples were start, when they went into pagan territories, you know, one of the very important things that they did is this. They worked hard. Paul was a tent maker. He had to show that he is sweating himself, selling tents and making money in that way. And the pagans who saw him witnessing so this guy, he's, he's, he's a decent guy. He's not depending on the donations and offerings and things like that. He is killing himself, waking flat out, getting his money in the evenings he's preaching. So if you read, read the book of Thessalonica, you'll read, read how Paul says, when we came to you, we didn't charge you for anything we did. We worked hard for it. So the culture that they're developing here is that Jesus must never be interpreted as just a mystic idea or a mystic concept that you can think that you just think of Jesus and out comes money or something like that. We have to work out. Although Jesus has done, um, given money to people too. Yeah, other, Jesus has done miracles in other places, in some other individual's life. But generally, Jesus expects us to work out. So, all I'm saying is this, young people, we are a powerful group of people. We are a powerful group because the powerful God is with us. The only thing is that the combination of a powerful God with weak people must be right. The combination, how we combine and link must be right. That's the point I'm making. The disciples, Learn the trick 
of trusting that power and just simply be faithful to what God was asking them to. If we can simply do the same thing and we trust in God, do faithfully what he's asking us to do, I tell you, wonderful things will happen. And just recently as I was thinking about this thought that I want to say this week, I thought to myself, man, the culture that we're dealing with is a culture that has rejected God. But is it possible that the power of the gospel can destroy that culture just like the gospel story destroyed the Roman, Roman civilization? I believe it can. The power of the gospel can destroy. And the devil knows it. So what the devil is doing is he's making sure that we are not persistent well. And the way we live is a powerless, ineffective lifestyle we live, and we become powerless people. If we can somehow spend a lot of time meditating on what the Holy Spirit did in the lives of the early disciples, we will be powerful people. We will be powerful people. Many times, many people want the blessings, but they do not want the commitment that God wants us to give. Just recently, I was knocking on a door, down in Enmo, this Greek family. The man has just died. That's the father of the house, has died. Leaving behind his wife and two children, son and a daughter. The son and the daughter have grown up, and they're men and women now. They're living together in the same house. But when we went inside this particular house, they were so caught up. They, they come from the Greek Orthodox Church, so they are so caught up with their rituals. They're caught up with signs, images of the cross, and images of saints, all these saints, you know. They, they're so caught up with, in this. And when we went inside, the lady of the house says, oh, pastor, he says, I have a feeling that the house I am, is house we have, this unit here, is being cursed by some demonic powers around here. I, was, I felt a bit weird in believing these people. This is Australia, Sydney, not in PNG. So this is his family saying, we feel that our house is cursed. And this is what he says, the evidence of the case, he said, you know what? The television thing here suddenly broke, he said. And then within days, the computer in the, in the room, mail function didn't work, he said. And then something else. There's a number of other things that, that were happening in the house. So man, I think there's a, there's a demon here. Looking at us. I'm so scared, then guy says. I'm so scared, I can't even go to the balcony and look out. I think I feel this demon is looking at us. I mean, what, what do you do? <laughs> I said, you know what? There's a power more powerful than those demons, I told him. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit is more powerful. He that is in you is more powerful than he that is in the world. And I related some experience that I had in PNG. And even then, he was not convinced. I said, the only way you can remove those power that you feel are, are trying to destroy you is you have to look at a powerful force, which is the power of God. And all he wondered is this. This is what he was all the time saying. He said, Lord, he said, just pray, 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 so that the power can go away. Uh, how about... If I gave you a devotional book and you read every day and you pray every day. He didn't say yes to that. Just do something, put a cross or some holy waters or some, some sort of things around here, he said. Holy waters maybe is okay, a cross, how many crosses is okay? No, 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 not that one. The real power that can remove that power is if you invite Jesus to be part of your life. You read the Bible and pray every day, and Jesus be part of your life. 
Still, he didn't like that. I found it extremely difficult to understand how he could think like that. There is a twisted mind of someone else like that now. All I'm trying to say is that how the devil is engineering in making us incapable so we don't know how to tap on the power that God has given us. That's what I'm saying. We become powerless because we are ineffective at reaching the power that is available, that we can use. Anyway, I hope it's making sense. Anyway, I'll finish. God will bless you. There's a second part to it, and I'll share it next time. <coughs> okay, let's all stand up and we'll pray. Thank you. Um, let's close our eyes and we'll pray. Mighty God in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, we thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. We may look weak few in number, meeting high at all. But Father, we have a power that knows how to crush every other power. Like a neutron bomb, even little ounce of this power from heaven can dismantle anything and anyone. Father, we claim that power today, that our conduct our life, our words and thoughts will model you that we position ourselves as soldiers of the cross to be possessed by you, that that power will come powerfully to dismantle the enemy that is building images of systems in this world. O oh Lord, Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for using us and the church. In Jesus' name, amen.